This video is for Unit 2.1, Introduction to Populations. So the first question is, what is a population? You know, we talk about a population of a city, but in biology, a population is a very specific thing. Please record this definition. A population is a group of organisms of the same species living in the same geographical area. So here we have two examples of populations that I've shown you. We've got a population of ladybugs because they're all ladybugs, so they're all the same species and they're all living in the same area. Also have a population of tulips because they're all the same species, they're all tulips, and they're living in the same area. So those are both populations. Why do we care about this for biology? Well, scientists and a lot of other people actually are interested in how populations grow or change over time. So to stay with some examples we've been using in class, the size of the white-tailed deer population is used to make decisions about hunting permits. So what, how many white-tailed deer we have on a regular basis from year to year needs to be determined. So the population of white-tailed deer needs to be determined so we know how many permits to give out. Okay, so what can change a population? What makes a population go up or down? The first category we're going to look at is increases in populations. So there are two things that can make a population go up. The first one is births. Anything that causes more organisms to be born or to germinate in the case of seeds would be an increase in the population. The other thing that can increase a population is called immigration. Now you've maybe heard of immigration in like your social studies class or on the news. Immigration in terms of people is when people move into a new country. They're immigrating to that country. But this also happens in biological populations. Organisms move from one habitat to another, and they immigrate into that population. There are two things overall that can decrease populations. The first is deaths. So anything that causes more deaths in a population is going to decrease that population. The second is called emigration. Exiting a population or leaving a population, the fancy word for that is emigration. So if a robin leaves its population and goes to a different population of robins, that would be emigration from its original population. An easy way to remember emigration and immigration and the difference is I for immigration, you can remember into. So this is organisms moving into a population. E for emigration, you can remember exit organisms exiting out of a population. Okay, there are two types of population growth that we're going to discuss. Um, things that typically happen over time as we see these births and deaths and immigration and emigration affecting a population. So if we take a look at the first one called exponential growth, the easiest way to define this is by again looking at the births, the deaths, emigration, and immigration. So, oh I see I have a little typo here. The B represents births. This letter should be an I for immigration. So the births plus the immigration, these are the positives, the things that make the population grow, are greater than, I'm going to add in that greater than sign, greater than the deaths and emigration. Those are your negatives, right? So deaths and emigration are going to subtract from the population. So if the positives are greater than the negatives, what is our population going to look like? It's just going to keep increasing, right? If we consistently have more positives than negatives, the population is going to go up, 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 up. And that's our exponential growth. An example of an organism that does this is bacteria. Bacteria will grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, um, and their population will keep increasing. Now, why would this happen in a population? What kind of characteristics do these exponential growth populations So what we're looking for in our graph then, and this is what we did in class with the Skittles, is a consistently increasing line. The rate of change will be slow at first, and at the end, it's going to increase even faster and faster. Okay, so this is a typical graph for an exponential graph. All right, what causes this? Number one, no limiting factors. 
Okay, we're talking a little bit later about what limiting factors might be, um, and I'm going to define those for you. But basically, they're things that slow down the rate of growth. And none of these limiting factors exist in an exponential population because it keeps uh, growing. We aren't going to have any individuals dying, and all are reproducing. So in a bacterial population, uh, which they reproduce so quickly, and one bacteria can split into two, this can happen. Okay? The bacteria reproduce faster than what they're dying, and all the bacteria are reproducing. They don't have to be a certain age before they can have babies. The graph looks like a J-curve, we just graph that out. So it curves upward, kind of like a J. Besides bacteria, another place we might find this is in new environments. So for example, um, a new volcanic island. There's lots of resources and not a lot of competition for those resources between organisms. And another way we might find this is if an invasive species enters a new habitat. So invasive species are species that don't belong in an area and they're introduced into that area and kind of take off and start reproducing like crazy. Some you might be familiar with are Asian carp. Those are those jumping carp that sometimes you see in the news. They're reproducing like crazy in the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River. Also the Asian beetles that kind of look like ladybugs. We have lots of those all over because they can reproduce exponentially. Not a lot of things eat them, they reproduce really quickly, um, they just are increasing exponentially. Also, we might see this after a catastrophic, catastrophic event, for example, a forest fire. After a forest fire, we've wiped out a lot of the competition, there's new fresh soil that can be used, the seeds and the plants that start to grow back are going to grow back in an exponential growth because nothing is slowing them down. Okay, the second type of growth pattern we see in organisms is called logistic growth. So exponential is number one, logistic is number two. And again, I have my typos I have to fix here. All right, so our Ds, remember our Is. Okay, and the Bs stand for birth, I stands for immigration, D stands for death, E stands for emigration. So in this case, in the beginning of logistic growth, the births are going to be higher than the deaths again, just like in exponential growth. But the difference is, as you go in through logistic growth through time, it's going to start to slow down in growth to eventually the point where the births and immigration are equal to the deaths and emigration. So you can see here at the beginning, we have a typical pattern of an exponential growth, but then at the end, it starts to equal out. And most biological populations will go through this kind of growth. Most populations cannot keep growing and growing and growing without slowing down because of some reason. So when we graph out this one, okay, we're looking at over time, first to start to increase exponentially and then level off. Okay, this is where the births and deaths Sorry, where the births and immigration are greater than the deaths and emigration. And here, where it levels out, is where the births and immigration are equal to the deaths and emigration. So there's no change. The population isn't increasing, but isn't necessarily decreasing either. Okay, so why does the logistic growth curve do this? Well, this population has what we call limiting factors. And again, I will define those for you better in a little bit. But they're things that slow down that growth rate. The resulting shape uh, when you graph this population is, again, this S curve. It's not a perfect S, but basically it starts to curve and then slows down. And this isn't great either because I kind of backtracked. Let me see if I can do a better S curve. There, that's a little better. And it has a special area on the logistic curve called a carrying capacity. Carrying capacity can only grow as, or the population can only grow as large as the carrying capacity allows. And we talked about this in the Skittles activity as well. So let's take a closer look at that. The carrying capacity, as a definition, is the maximum number of individuals the resources of a location can support. So if we go back to our S curve, for logistic growth, we start out exponential, we level off, 
this point right here, we'll do a dashed line here, okay, so that point where it levels off is the carrying capacity. So if this is one individual, two, three, four, five, six, right here at six individuals is our carrying capacity. So that's the most individuals that population can support before it starts to level off because the resources have limited the growth of the population. All right, one more idea to introduce, and here's this uh, idea of limiting factors that I kept referring to. So we have two types of limiting factors, uh, things that can slow down or um, stop the growth of a population. So limiting factors slow population growth. The first type of limiting factor is called a density independent limiting factor. So this type of factor will affect a population, so it will slow down the population growth no matter how big that population is. So it affects small and large populations the same. And large populations the same. A density dependent factor is more likely to affect bigger populations. So this is something that slows down population growth even more when the population gets bigger. I think one of the best ways to talk about this is just to give you some examples. So on the left hand side here, these are density independent factors. So these are going to affect a population no matter how big it is. A natural disaster like a tornado or a hurricane is going to hit large populations and small populations. It doesn't matter if you're a small population. If a tornado comes through, it's going to affect you. Environmental changes, like climate change, for example, is going to affect large populations and small populations. It's not going to miss a large population or a, large, or a smaller population. And finally, migration. Migration happens in small populations and large populations, regardless of size. On the other side here, we've got those density dependent factors. Now, these, remember, have a bigger impact on larger populations. So the larger a population is, the more likely it's going to be affected by predation or other things eating it, right? The larger the population, the more members of that population are going to be eaten. Disease. Larger populations are more likely to get disease because the organisms live closely to, uh, with each other. The transmission or the spreading of a virus between those organisms is higher. That's why you often see like outbreaks of the flu during the winter happen first in the bigger cities because bigger populations are more likely to have that disease in them. And finally, resources. So if you're a bigger population, you're going to run out of resources like water or shelter more quickly than a smaller population. So hopefully that gives you a better idea about the difference between density independent and density dependent factors. Don't forget to do your form when you're all done with the notes for this video.